Welcome to Recalibrate Reality, the future of New York. Our guest today is Margaret Anadu, the Global Head of Sustainability and Impact at Goldman Sachs. Margaret leads Goldman's efforts surrounding inclusive growth and climate transition, two core pillars of the firm's overall sustainability strategy. In this episode, Margaret and I discuss how Goldman uses a multifaceted approach to invest in underserved areas. We also talked about how the firm is leading by example to build equity and promote diversity, both internally and externally. And so now, let's recalibrate reality with Margaret Anadu. Margaret, welcome to Recalibrate Reality. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great to have you here. So, so Margaret, you're, you're now the head of uh, global sustainability and impact asset management and the chairwoman of the Urban Investment Group, amongst a number of other roles that you play at Goldman Sachs. Can, can you take a minute to share a little bit about your story, uh, your background, how you came to Goldman right out of college, and how, particularly as, as a black woman, you've navigated to become a partner in one of the most powerful, influential institutions uh, in the world? Sure. I mean, so I guess to start, I'll acknowledge I'm, I'm, I'm an unlikely finance person. I actually joined Goldman Sachs right out of college with a very specific goal of saving up money to go to law school. And, you know, probably, you know, it was probably only a few months into my tenure at the firm that I got hooked. I, I really enjoyed my colleagues. I liked the energy. And for someone who I didn't, you know, I also didn't study finance or, or economics in, in college. So I really did a truly learn on the job. And I was just struck by how the capital markets, the flow of investments, finance was truly just at the center of everything. Um, and so that was that was 18 years ago, and and I'm still here. And it certainly wasn't wasn't what I anticipated. So I actually spent just a couple years in sales and trading. That was my first job in finance. I was a um, an equity derivatives strategist, and I knew that I wanted to, as I said, be at Goldman. I loved the energy. I loved the you know the pursuit of excellence. But I wanted to find something that. Um, I could do that that was just going to have a little bit more, not a little bit more, quite frankly, a lot more uh, purpose. And so I moved over to the Urban Investment Group, which I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about more in the conversation uh, back in 2005. And, you know, here I am as, as the chairwoman today and got to be a part of the growth of the business, uh, the growth of impact investing more, more broadly. And so to my role today that you mentioned, um, Global Head of Sustainability and Impact, I get to really... Um, both enjoy, but also really embed that sense of purpose, sustainability, climate transition, inclusive growth, all of these uh, really big issues that we're focused on across of all our investing businesses. So our alternative businesses, private credit, real estate, uh, corporate equity, but also our traditional in investing businesses as well. So fixed income, uh, public equity, our liquidity solutions, and really think about how we can use our capital, and really importantly, as stewards of other people's capital to really make progress on some of these really um, big global challenges. And so it's, uh, I say it all the time, I have the best job in the building. That's for sure. It's, it's, it sounds like though, you know, part of what you've done is also tried to make this social impact uh, strategy ubiquitous with all aspects of, of the firm. What was the, was the, the group uh, as focused on that um, when you when you joined, or was that something that evolved over the last number of years? You know, it, it's 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 certainly been an evolution. So it, it's funny if we go back to two thousand one, which is when the the Urban Investment Group started. We didn't even have some of this language. So the way that we speak so um, kind of easily and fluently today around whether it's ESG, sustainability. You know, values aligned investing, double bottom line investing. There's so much terminology um, and energy around it. There's a whole industry around the standards. How do we measure it? The impacts? What are we seeking? But back in 2001, you know, it, it was it was a fairly small and, and humble effort. You know, very simply, we thought that there were not thought new that there were neighborhoods and cities all across the country, and individuals and families, importantly, all across the country, that with the right effort, with the right focus, with the right intention, we could be making investments that were not only commercially viable and, and profitable and generate risk-adjusted returns, but also really um, 
create value for people in these communities. They were um, underinvested, overlooked. Uh, quite frankly, the, the right level of attention was, was certainly just not paid to these communities. And so as much as that was an impact opportunity, it's also an investment opportunity. And so that business grew from um, to your question about the evolution of it. You know, when I joined, we were investing, you know, 10, 20 million dollars a year. Uh, excitedly, that was a, you know, that was a big year. We were, you know, very, very proud of that work uh, until, you know, last year, just to give you some figures in 2020, uh, the business deployed uh, almost $2 billion. And so it's been an incredible growth of that effort. And I think the backdrop and context for that uh, is really the whole industry that's been evolving. If, you know, if we take a similar kind of historical journey with, you know, ESG, environmental, social, and, and governance efforts, I think 10, 15 years ago, so much more nascent. It was really around people looking in their portfolios and saying, you know, what, what can I exclude? You know, I don't want to um, invest in private prisons or I'm not going to invest in companies that uh, manufacture weapons. So it was, it was, it was almost a, a defensive strategy. What am I going to exclude? Fast forward to where we are today, that's still an important part of the flexibility we want to provide to our, to our clients, those exclusions. But also there's much more offense. What are the companies, strategies, themes that I'm going to be investing in that are going to have a clear positive impact, right? Not just let's not just do no harm, uh, but how do I really make progress around climate transition? How do I invest in renewable energy? How do I um, invest in a much more diverse set of fund managers and really um, you know, invest in diversity? So there are all these things that you can do that are much more direct and tangible. And so I think that that evolution has also been incredible. Yeah, and, and you know, while Goldman's been a pioneer at this, you could really see over the last 24 months or so, a, uh, a the sort of a, a, a more apparent view that people expect companies to be socially responsible. It's almost been this renegotiation of this social compact. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I look at is the stakeholders, not just investors, um, but the employees themselves that have a, a greater sense of social uh, responsibility. And what you said, right, you started in your job of you wanted a sense of purpose. You wanted to come and be a part of something that was going to make the world a better place, not just generate financial returns. And I think that there's a whole generational shift to that, that sense of purpose that, um, you know, makes it a more attractive place to work if you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think, and I think we're seeing that across the board in all industries. I think, I think we used to focus on one set of stakeholders. You, you'd have companies that were focused on, you know, what's, what's gonna be the regulatory impact to my industry? What, you know, what is, what is a carbon tax gonna look like for my, you know, my profitability, my economics? And then of course, they're, they're the shareholders and you're seeing this so much in, uh, you know, stewardship and, and proxy voting. What are, what are the owners of my, you know, publicly traded company going to think and feel about what I'm doing? And, and you hit on it. Now it's also, it's employees, but it's also just customers, right? Millennials. And I think people almost overweight their efforts here on, on young folks. I, I do think it's, it's a broader set of the population. You know, all these surveys recently show that people not only want to spend their money, uh, with companies that are aligned with their values, whether that's around you know in inclusive themes or uh, the environment, but they're also willing to spend more money to do so. That there's literally more value for people uh, to do business with, to support, um, to engage with companies that are going to be thoughtful and and mindful about how their products, how their services, how their approach are really impacting communities and uh, literally in, you know impacting our planet. And so. What you have now to this point about stakeholders, it's everyone. It's your, it's your investors, it's your regulators, it's your customers, it's your employees, it's your, it's your peers. And so I think we are definitely at, um, at a real inflection point. And I think, it's, I think it's exciting. I think the acceleration that we've seen, especially through the pandemic, I think that um, you know, there were a lot of questions around you know, ESG investing more broadly towards the beginning of the pandemic, that if we're all going to be focused on this big global reckoning, these health issues, our economies, does ESG fall to the wayside? 
um, do, or are we too busy right now to, to really be thinking about these issues? And, and what we saw was just the opposite. You had the highest amount of inflows into ESG strategies on record uh, in 2020. You actually, you know, from a, from a public markets perspective, you also saw a lot of these strategies actually outperform uh, during the pandemic. So I think, I think we're at a very, very exciting and also important, important moment. Yeah, and I, and I think that if you have a situation where doing good is also good business and you're able to harness that power, then the potential for impact and sustainable uh, impact is greater than ever before, which is great. And, and, and Goldman's been doing this a long time. You brought up the pandemic. You know, I'm curious as to some of the programs that you, you have done historically and as uh, COVID came, you know, what were some of those initiatives that actually helped you adjust for COVID, help some of the, the communities, um, you know, based on those experiences? Yeah. You know, one, one, you know, I could probably, I could probably pluck a, pluck a few examples um, from around the firm, but one, and one that's certainly um, uh, near, near and dear to my heart, we actually had a, a, a big team meeting about it yesterday. You know, we've, we've had an initiative, a firm-wide initiative called 10,000 Small Businesses. This was something that we built uh, coming out of the last crisis, knowing that our investment in and support of small businesses was going to be really important for the economy in the U.S., knowing the role that small businesses were going to need to play in all the job creation that we really we really needed to, to see. And so we developed this initiative that had an education component for small businesses working with community colleges, and then importantly, an access to capital component where we partnered uh, with community development financial institutions all around the country. And think, think of CDFIs as... Um, your neighborhood, you know, mission-driven lender. And these are the lenders who really roll up their sleeves, uh, sit with businesses, understand their challenges, and really, really, really assist them with capital, but they're with their business more broadly. Uh, and so we, you know, we work with dozens of CDFIs around the country, and they're really, really um, uh, effective with working with minority-owned businesses, businesses in low-income communities, businesses in rural communities. Uh, where a lot of times the, you know, the mainstream banking system just isn't serving those, those neighborhoods as well. And so we've had you know, over a decade of history working with these institutions. We've deployed hundreds of, of millions of dollars with them. And so if we think back to last spring as the you know, pandemic was um, uh, setting in and we were all just realizing just, just how dramatic an impact this was gonna have on our main street businesses with all the closures, it was, it was amazing for us to get to turn to the CDFIs that we've been working with for over a decade and built many relationships and said, you know, what do you need? Like we're, we're, we're in a crisis. And actually to, to your point about earlier experiences, we'd also worked with some of these same CDFIs, you know, after Hurricane Harvey in Texas, you know, Superstorm Sandy here, here in New York. And these were lenders that we were able to turn to, actually at Superstorm Sandy, we set up an emergency lending um, uh, vehicle with a CDFI here in New York in three days, right? Because these were, you know, small businesses and communities where, you know, you lose your inventory, your refrigerators out, like, you know, they're, they're, it's, um, it's a real touch, you know, touch and go situation. So we were able to turn to a lot of those same institutions and say, you know, we know that you're going to be on the front lines in these communities, supporting these businesses who are not only dealing with the economic challenges of these closures, but also their employees' health challenges. Your, you know, small business owners are, um, you know, the real lifeblood of the communities that 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 we work in. They are, they're the real community anchors. And so, trying to figure out, am I going to be open? <laughs> am, am I going to be closed? I'm I'm dealing with my, you know, employees' health challenges. Probably dealing with their own family's challenges. Um, and so we um, were able to. We started out with two hundred. 50 million, we're like, let's get, you know, some capital to these CDFIs, they can deploy it to these small businesses. And of course, as, as the gravity of the crisis just kept escalating, we went to 500 million and then 750. And, and ultimately, we, we committed over, over $2 billion. Wow. And we're able to support thousands of, of small businesses across the country in, in a real moment of need. But importantly, I always look through the, the small business stats to, to the numbers of employees. And this is, you know, over hundreds of thousands of employees who are able to be, you know, supported during this crisis through, again, these incredible community development financial institutions, which had we not been doing this economic development work with small businesses dating back to the last crisis, we wouldn't have had those relationships and been able to, uh, to move so quickly. So it's, uh, it's, um, 
it, it is nice to have the longevity uh, in the work to be able to to respond quickly in a in a moment of need. Yeah, and I think you know as people think of Goldman Sachs as this big global bank, I don't think they appreciate the network that you have built locally because the reality is uh, the small businesses, as you pointed out, were probably the most susceptible to the impact of COVID with the least amount of staying power. Um, but to actually get to them, you really need to have those local relationships. You know, you can't sit Absolutely. in New York and just write checks and think it's going to work. You need people that have the relationships, know what the issues are, mentor them through that. And so you you built a muscle uh, at Goldman that you were able to activate again in this instance to help do that, which is which is terrific as as you think through it. And then on on the other side, you're also yourselves directly investing in projects in underserved communities, which I'm sure during COVID. Um, there were some of those projects that went through a moment that you've probably been working on for years. And there was a question as to, uh, you know, can we withstand COVID? I know we went through what, you know, we called the, the pandemic pause and a little bit of this chaos yeah. from COVID before there was clarity. Um, you know, w w maybe we can talk about some of those projects and how you push through that fog of uncertainty that existed during COVID. Yeah, this was... Um... I mean, as, 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 as you can imagine, and I know so many of the developments that, that your company is working on in, in, in some of these same communities, I'll be honest, it was, it was, it was a hard, hard time. Um, and I think what was difficult for um, certainly me and I, and I think many, many members of the team is, you know, I, you know, I've, I've been in the urban investment group for, for, for 16 years, right? This is, this is, this is, this is most of what I've done. And so, to work every day working on you know projects and with you know not for profits and developers and and the city to develop projects whether it's housing or a grocery store or an industrial facility that's going to create jobs you're doing that because you believe in the potential of uh, these communities and these individuals and 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 families and so during the pandemic it was very clear very early that there was a significantly disproportionate impact on black communities, on you know, black and brown communities, certainly on low-income communities. And that really had to do with just a, an underinvestment in the infrastructure in those communities for decades, whether it was the, you know, the housing infrastructure, uh, the healthcare infrastructure, so much of um, that weakness and underinvestment, you know, was laid pretty bare during the pandemic. And so to feel like in a moment of uncertainty around in, you know, and investing in, in, in capital and capital and where were the places to, to invest, it was, it was incredibly difficult to, to know that in this moment where there's this level of uncertainty, the communities that we invest in and the projects that we focus on are more important than ever. Um, and so, you know, back in, back in the, the spring, the first thing we did, of course, was, you know, you got it, you got to, shore up the portfolio, like, you know, you know, urgently making sure that all of our, all of our clients and, and stakeholders were okay, right? Because the same, the same, you know, not for profits that we partner with to do, you know, an incredible, you know, mixed income development bed for Stuyvesant are the same not for profits who are providing social services in those communities. And that could be that's that's food. You know, I was talking to the executive director of, of, of one of the not for profits we work with with work with in Brooklyn. And I'm like, you know, how how are things going? Because we you know, we have some seniors housing, uh, affordable housing developments with him. And, and he was trying to get Wi-Fi, you know, into into families homes for virtual schooling. Uh, they were doing some, you know, weatherization work like, you know, it, it was all hands on deck in a way that. Um, you know, I think people, if you don't work with a lot of these local organizations can even, can even imagine. Um, and so there was, there was both this, this feeling of urgency, not only to, you know, support those institutions, make sure we were doing everything we could, you know, I mentioned some of the small business work, but to make sure that deals that we were working on, you know, and sometimes it's, you're working on it for six months, sometimes it's several years, we're going to move forward, that we were going to demonstrate that, you know, in this moment, uh, our commitment is and always, you know, will be will be real and will stay true to it. You know, thinking about one um, one great example, and I'm so 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 proud of this of this work. You know, it was in the summer. It was June of last year that we closed um, on a really large economic development project that we're working on for 
for several years with the National Urban League up on 125th Street. And we actually uh, started construction uh, a few a few weeks ago. And, you know, Scott, this is, I mean, you know, you know how complicated and, and, and hairy some of these deals can get. This was a project that we were working on with um, the state of New York, uh, the city of New York, who co co owned the land so you know that that brings its opportunities and, and complexity uh we're working on you know a you know new headquarters for the national urban league right the oldest civil rights organization in the country and keeping them in new york city was really 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 uh important uh there's mixed income housing that's a part of this transaction and in harlem in an area where we know it's gotten so much more expensive than it was you know 10 20 years ago and making sure that we have um, housing that's new and, and quality for those Harlem residents to really remain in their community. Uh, it has, uh, you know, cultural space, right? 125th Street, it's, you know, a, a real, you know, cultural anchor in New York City, has office space, you know, retail. We were able to um, to bring in uh, Target and a Trader Joe. So there, there's just so much impact that we were excited about uh, driving in this development. And the idea of you know, delaying or not closing because of COVID, just not an option, like not, not an option. Um, and so we, you know, we, we, we closed the, the transaction, as I mentioned, we, you know, we started construction recently and there, there was something fairly special about it. You know, the National Urban League, their, their entire focus is about, you know, the advancement and economic prosperity of, of Black Americans and, and other minorities. And part of the development is, an, you know, a, a center for, for race and justice. And so it was not lost on any of our team or, you know, anyone here at Goldman working on it that we are, we're dealing with this in, intense and painful racial you know, reckoning with, you know, Maude Arbery and, and, and George Floyd and, and just so many countless uh, lives that have been lost. And we were closing that deal while, you know, protesters were marching down my street. Um, and so to be able to, you know, move, move that forward would have been, you know, an incredible deal of the year <laughs> type moment in any year, but certainly, uh, certainly in, in 2020 was all the more special. And your public-private partnerships in general uh, tend to be extraordinarily complex. You went through the litany of all the different stakeholders that are involved in government. And, you know, people typically, when they think about public-private partnerships, they think about airports or big municipal buildings yeah. and, and uh, which, you know, that's, there's always a lot of capital that want to flow into, into that mix and they're complex in their own right. But when you're doing them in, uh, you know, socioeconomically challenged areas that have you know, the, all these different stakeholders, it's not just like selling the dream for the capital. You have to sell the dream to the community that Goldman Sachs is here to be a partner to help build a more sustainable, a more equitable community and that you're going to be there through good and bad, which you did prove. And I mm -hmm. think was, as COVID happens, it's, 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 you know, it's moments like that, that you really, you know, win the, the stronger bonds and trust of those uh, relationships going forward that you can build upon and uses a model for other projects. But I think it's important because, you know, in these communities, their, their natural inclination is to think, okay, here comes big money, gonna gentrify me out, make my community less uh, affordable for me and my children versus no, we're here to try to help, you know, spark economic growth and opportunity for the people in the community, which is, yeah. you know, a whole different you know, dialogue. One, one, yeah, and, and, and one one thing that, that we do find and we, you know, we we work very hard to earn, you know, the the trust of our of our community partners, and and part of that is just having the approach that it should be earned. You know, no one in so many. And I, you know, I grew up in a um, you know pretty poor neighborhood in 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 Houston, Texas, and you know, people in in neighborhoods like the one I grew up in are sold so many false dreams um, about you know this this new neighborhood plan and this economic development plan and and there's a lot of um a lot of mistrust has been built over uh decades and and generations and so yes we we do what we we do what we say we're going to do uh over and over and over again we don't we don't take for granted uh the relationships that we build and the relationships that, that we need to be successful right we have we have, we certainly have, we have capital, we have, we have expertise. We, we are, you know, lucky and, and, and very fortunate to work with an amazing set of, 
um, mission driven, you know, development partners and, and not for profit partners, but we never, we never take those relationships for, for granted. We have to, you know, you have to, you have to wake up and earn them again every day. You know, one thing that through this um, series that keeps coming up is to really deal with the systemic racial inequity is that you need to be uh, more intentional than ever before and mm -hmm. uh, and taking intentional action to and, 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 and focusing on things that are more programmatic. Um, and what, as, as I've looked at what uh, Goldman has done, what's impressed me is the how when you when you look at the different types of programs that you have that you're touching everything from from philanthropy, the power of your capital, to um, the, the, the power of your network with the small businesses, to your research groups that are, are out there, um, to, uh, to how you yourself as a group are leading by example, even with your CEO, David Solomon, coming out and saying, this is gonna be a, uh, a priority uh, as, as we go forward, right? So it's, 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 you know, it's, it's something that is, is unique, I think. And maybe if you could just talk a little bit about how you bring this sort of holistic approach to dealing with uh, you know, racial inequality and trying to you know deal with the systemic nature of that. Yeah, you know, so um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned David Solomon. So much of it, um, and 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 you know, you 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 run a you run a very large company it is is about is about leadership and the example that's that's set from the top. And so as we were again over the, and I'm, I'm sure like like many organizations. Over the last year, uh, really digging deep and thinking, what do, what are we going to do in this in this moment? Right, everyone saying we need we need to do more. The status quo is unacceptable. Um, you know, we are clearly living in a in a society that is deeply uh, negatively impacted by systemic racism. You know, gender inequality. You know, opportunity just quite frankly, not being, you know, distributed or, or available in a way that's, that's equitable. Um, and so it was, it was a real process of, of deciding what we were going to do, what we were best positioned to do, uh, what made sense for the type of institution that we are. And so David, you know, laid, you know, laid down a, a real challenge and said, you know, and, and I think we all are, we've been, you know, we, talked a little about the urban investment group. We've been investing in, in black communities literally for, for decades. We found a way to do that in a, you know, partnership driven, uh, you know, stakeholder driven approach. Uh, you know, I talked a little bit about 10,000 small businesses. We, you know, we have history and expertise with large scale, you know, economic development uh, initiatives where we can put both, you know, commercial and philanthropic uh, power behind them. And a, a one initiative I didn't talk about, which was our, which was a, a real example of us being so um, research driven in the in the foundation of an initiative. So ten thousand women. Uh, this is an initiative that we launched, uh, gosh, it's like 16, 17 years ago now, uh, and it started with a piece of research called Womenomics. And uh, the idea there was that if we wanted to, and of course we all do, uh, increase global GDP, one of the best investments we could be making is in women entrepreneurs, especially in um, uh, developing countries. And so it was a great piece of, of, of research. And we developed an initiative around that to, it's called, it was called 10,000 Women. And it was uh, to really provide women entrepreneurs in countries like Nigeria, Rwanda, um, you know, China with education, and then ultimately with, with capital and in partnership with the World Bank. And so if you fast forward to, to today, and we recently uh, just in March announced a large scale racial equity initiative called One Million Black Women. The mission and goal of that initiative is to narrow opportunity gaps for at least 1 million Black women over the next decade. We have $10 billion of investment capital behind it, $100 million of philanthropic capital. Um, but instead of having it you know, very targeted to you know, one investing business or, or one team, it really is an approach for all of our investing businesses to to contribute and play a role. It's not it's not going to be, you know, all housing equity or all you know small business lending. It's how do we really bring the full force of of right? We you know we've been investing for 150 years, right? This is right. this is something we uh, we know how to do, and we know that we can put the right resources and capital behind ideas and innovations that are going to make a real difference, and that's and that's going to have an impact even beyond the 10 billion. I think what's what's my kind of north, you know, north star, if you will, in the initiative is how do we change the way we even think about these investments? What, it, what does it mean to 
think about the impacts on an underserved population, and, and we think that this can go beyond just, just Black women in the investing process in and of itself. How do we, you know, we have our, our yields and IRRs and multiples and, and all of those things that, you know, we're, we're looking at and focused on all the time, which we're going to be certainly in this initiative as well. But how do we add those additional um, metrics and almost make it second nature? And so even the conversations, and look, we only, we only announced in March, you know, we're sitting in an investment committee saying, but, but how many Black women are going to be impacted? In what way? What is, what is enough provision of health care for us to say we've actually, you know, really narrowed an opportunity gap? What's that hurdle? What does that look like? How do we, how do we track it? How do we make sure our partners are not um, just incentivized to drive these impacts, but required? And that 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 level of conversation and intentionality, Scott, I'm I'm over the moon. I mean, this is you know, I think I think I think we're really creating uh, change here in, internally and and of course the impacts that that we're going to have in communities. Well, let me ask you a question because Goldman has got so much power, uh, so so many resources, right, to to really enforce this change. If if a and one of your clients or Goldman's clients reaches out to you that doesn't have those type of resources and says, listen. We're, we're committed to the same values. You're doing a great job. Let us learn from you. What, what should we do? What would some of your advice be to them? Oh, that's a great question. And actually, and we, as you can imagine, we, we have those conversations all the time. And certainly uh, the pace of them over the last year has been, has been incredible. I mean, I think, I think the one, and we, I could talk for hours about all, all my, all my thoughts on what people do, right. but I, I think one central idea is to try to embed whatever impact you're trying to have or whatever or whatever change you want to see in your core business, right? We're always going to, and I think I think most organizations have, um, you know, efforts that are that are on the side, and that doesn't that doesn't mean that they're not valuable and that they're not driving driving impact. But I think there's something really powerful when a company looks at its its core products, its core services, its its core engagement with its customers and finds ways to drive impact within that because it's just, it's just going to be stickier. It's going to be, it's going to be, you know, sustainable. I think there's something about looking to the center first, like what are the things that we are literally doing every single day? Um, what, what can we do in that process? Who am I hiring? Um, what do my employees think? And so I, I think there's something about the the centrality of impact within an organization that I think is 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 powerful. Right. Leaning into their domain expertise, which makes a, a lot of sense, because that's where they can have the greatest impact. You know, you used the example in in terms of what was happening in in Harlem, where you're working on that project, right? And you mm -hmm. it really demonstrated again that COVID made more transparent the have and have not. Um, the type of uh, economic environment we're living in. And unfortunately, one of the things that concerns me is that as we're recovering from COVID and when you look sort of on the surface, you have this big uh, you know, economic recovery and stock prices surging and uh, asset value surging for part of the economy. Yet, you know, there's a broad part of our economy and communities that were suffering before COVID that are actually even being set back further post COVID. H how do you think we keep um, you know, the David Solomons of the world, you know, laser focused on like he has been and you have been as a firm um, and we have been and all the others, right? Laser focused on the importance of addressing this systemic issue, even with the noise of this sort of, uh, you know, roaring 20s uh, economy that's coming out of this recovery. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's a real challenge and it, it's almost like the, the question that everyone's discussing is this a, you know, is this a moment or a movement? Um, you know, I've heard it. I've heard it discussed that way. You know, I think it, it goes back to, to some of the things we we touched on a little bit. I think it's about organizations uh, making changes or thinking about their impact in ways that, not to overuse the word, but would actually will be sustainable. Um, you know, I think it's it is. I think it's good to write um, you know a quick check and you know support organizations that are that are doing good work, but you know, you're going to write the check the next year, you're going to write the check the, the year after that. And so, you know, going back to just because you, you, know, you mentioned David Solomon on, on, on 1 million black women, like it is very purposefully a 10 year initiative. Right? We are, we are 
building. We are thinking about, um, you know, both enhancing and going deeper on a lot of the impact work that that we've done. And again, you know, you said the word how to do it more intentionally, but we're also focused on what what are the types of investments and 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 companies and strategies that don't exist today that we need to find a way to build and and resource. And that's 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 a that's a long that's just a longer game. And so I think it's about making the commitments, you know, to change to you know definitionally um, uh, sticky. And then I again I think it's also about making like and I'll, again I'll I'll just I'll use the the one million black black women example. If we get to a place where we have investors around our entire practice, not just our impact investments or our mission or our ESG, but really across the board, being far more thoughtful around how the companies we put capital behind, you know, engage with communities and and have a broader, you know, aperture and approach, that that way of, of thinking and approach should change, should change our business. Um, you know, on the, you know, also on, on the diversity side, right? We've seen We've seen a lot of companies, actually ourselves included, we, we released for, um, we've been doing them for a while, but in excruciating detail, we released our, our global people report that really goes into detail around um, the diversity of our workforce at different levels, right? You know, once that data is out there and you've created real aspirational goals about where, where you want to be and where you want to get to, there's no taking that back, right? So... I mean, creating, and actually that's, that's, I think, going to be one of the biggest, I think, long-term changes that I, that I, that I believe and, and I really hope will, will come out of the last year. I think once people have more diverse organizations and actually genuinely benefit from that broader set of ideas and, and, and approaches, that's, I, I believe that sticks because I think when people see the value of it. I think when people see the commerciality of it, you you won't want what you had in 2018. That won't that won't even be remotely attractive anymore. Um, and so, sorry, long, 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 long winded yeah, answer. Great. But I, I think it's about I think it's about making the the changes that are core and, and substantive. So we don't have to worry about what it looks like when it all falls away because it because it can't because right. it won't. Well, I mean, I think your point about people recognizing that diversity drives better outcomes, then this naturally becomes part of your DNA if you want to be some, a company that performs at your best capability because you need that diversity in those viewpoints. Mark, last question for you. So we're going to have a new mayor uh, sworn into New York uh, at the end of this, uh, beginning of next year. And and, and there, you know, as, think about New York City, this enormous bureaucracy, uh, $100 billion budget, uh, very difficult to navigate through. Um, the next mayor comes in to a city that itself is grappling with dealing with the uh, the, the, the racial ec- uh, inequalities, economic challenges, homelessness challenges, uh, you know, quality of life issues, social issues. You know, you yourself have been able to navigate the bureaucracy of Goldman Sachs and get people to focus on this. So if, if the, the mayor reached out to you and, and, and asked, you know, how do I, you know, move this, this bureaucracy? How do I turn this ship to make um, the changes similar that you did with Goldman in terms of making them structural and permanent and sustainable versus just a program that's here today and gone tomorrow. What would your advice be? Oh man. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think this next mayor has a, a, a tough job, um, a really important job, of course, at a, at, at an incredibly important time. I would say, and look, I think, I think, I think these are national issues. I I don't think they're, you know, they're isolated to New York. Um, And I think that we all have to believe that when we invest significantly, again, in the community infrastructure across neighborhoods in the city that's needed, and that is that is education, that is housing, that is, that is transit, that is the, um, the entrepreneurial uh, community, that those investments are just that. They truly are investments that are going to bear fruit and continue to make the city um, as competitive for 
talent um, and immigrants and businesses as it's as it's always been. It'd be one city with one mission to make it a more equitable, more sustainable city uh, as we go through it. So that's, that's great advice. Margaret, thank you for uh, your time. Thank you for your leadership, your, uh, your energy and your passion uh, are both intoxicating and motivating. And I think the more you can get out there and share what you're doing and, and your experiences as models for others. And uh, I think the, the, the more that we'll see a, an, an army of people that are committed to social impact like you are. So thank you very much for what you do thank and Nick Coleman does. Thanks for having me. All right, be well, be safe. Thank you. That concludes this week's episode of Recalibrate Reality. While most companies may not have the kind of resources like a Goldman Sachs, as you just heard, every company can find ways to better leverage their core business to support our communities, particularly underserved communities. Thank you again to Margaret Anadu and Goldman Sachs. Thank you to the Regional Plan Association, the 92nd Street Y, and thank you to the team for making this week's episode possible. I'm Scott Reckler from 75 Rockefeller Plaza. See you next week.